Good day, everyone. Welcome. My name is Edie Taylor. I am an improvement advisor with Comagine Health, focusing primarily on system-wide quality improvement and practice transformation. If you have any questions during the presentation, please use the chat feature, and I will be happy to get to any questions you might have. Just a reminder, we are also recording this session in case you have colleagues you would like to share this with, or you would like to go back and rewatch. Next slide. Comagine Health is a national nonprofit healthcare consulting firm. We work collaboratively with patients, providers, payers, and other stakeholders to reimagine, redesign, and implement sustainable improvements in the healthcare system. Next slide. So to start us out today, I have a question for you all, and I would like you to put your um, answer in chat. So I'd like to know who is responsible for infection prevention and control in your facility, organization, or business? It can be you, it can be um, maybe an infection prevention nurse. Sorry, didn't mean to have my camera. Didn't realize my camera was off, thank you. So if you can put that information in chat, it would be much appreciated. Thank you. Next slide. So an infection prevention and control program uh, needs to have effective management. So in order to have program management, you need to have designated staff members, training in infection prevention and control. And just in case you need a little extra training, the CDC offers, um, it's called Project First Line, and it's great education specializing in infection prevention. It's a great resource for anyone who has a desire to learn more about infection prevention. You also need engaged and supportive leadership and having that engaged and supportive leadership is important since they will be helping to support your program for, by providing the time and resources and accountability that is needed for a successful program. And the main thing we need to remember is that it's not just one person, it is an entire program. It involves not only all your staff, your leadership, but it also involves your residents and their families as well. Next slide. So some elements within our program are we need to have program risk assessments. And these are also risk assessments that are part of your emergency preparedness plan that's a requirement. So something to remember there. We wanna prioritize the risks and develop plans to reduce those risks. And then we wanna evaluate those on a routine basis to see if they're still effective. The risk assessment, is it up to date with the most current guidelines for that illness? Specifically COVID-19 guidelines. Um, they've changed multiple times over the course of the last few years. So looking at your current risk assessment and reflecting upon those uh, guidelines, are they up to date? Do they need to be up to date? So make sure that you're taking a look at those on a routine basis and that you're um, evaluating their effectiveness. Next slide. So this is our infection and prevention control Swiss cheese effect. So we're looking at things like hand hygiene, PPE, environmental cleaning. At any point, we could have a breakdown and that leads to a potential infection coming into our facility. And then all the while we have this little guy at the bottom, we'll call him our misinformation mouse. And so slowly but surely, he chews away on pieces and has the ability to open up a hole that had otherwise not been there. So we need to keep a vigilant eye out and work with staff and residents to keep him out by making sure we're providing good um, information-based resources and training, especially when it comes to PPE, hand washing, vaccines, keeping all of those things up to date and informative. Next slide. Another thing that we need to keep an eye out for is human factors. And what are human factors? That is the study uh, that is devoted to understanding how people interact with their environment and the products and objects in those environments. 
So as human beings, we have short attention spans. Even right now, I'm sure some of you may be multitasking and that's okay. But when it comes to our infection prevention, especially techniques and policy and procedure, we need to make sure that we're focused on those. And as human beings, again, we can only focus on one thing at a time. Anything we do in addition to that pulls us away from that main focus. We forget things. Even with the notes right in front of me as I give this presentation, there are things that I'm gonna to forget to tell you. So again, we're fallible. And when systems ask us to go and be above and beyond and stretch our limits, failures can occur. So that's something to be um, cognizant of. We need to make sure that we're focused on what we need to get done. As healthcare professionals, we can be set up to fail just because things are poorly designed, medical devices that don't work, uh, uncoordinated care process, fragmented systems. So working with staff to create process and unfragment how we work together is really important. So talking to other staff in other areas, facilities management, housekeeping, our kitchen staff helps to close those gaps. Next slide. So the chain of infection, it doesn't matter what the infection is, whether it's COVID-19 or C. diff or any other type of infection. We always want to make sure that we look for vulnerabilities in those chains. Things like our susceptible host, do we have a patient, a staff member, a resident who has um, an infection? Could they pass it to somebody else? So making sure that we're keeping an eye out for those little things so that we can keep that chain closed. Next slide. And this is an example of an infection risk assessment prioritization worksheet. This one is focused on COVID-19. So some of the things that you want to have on this are your community spread of COVID-19. Is it high? Is it low? And how does that affect the probability the risk will be, occur in your facility? Um, do you have residents or staff that have comorbidities that put them at higher risk? And what is the potential severity for that risk? Next slide. Some other things to consider. Do you have staff that work at other facilities? There's the potential for that cross-contamination or bringing something into your facility that wasn't otherwise there. Things like hand hygiene. How good is your teaching? How good is your... Um, you know, evaluation of those. So making sure that staff have current training in hand hygiene, as well as other things. Use of PPE, how well are they doing on that? I know we get tired of it and we're all tired of it, but it's really important to keep tabs on those things. Another important one is our ventilation. Do you know what the air exchange rates are for your facility? And if you don't know, now's a good time to get with your facilities management to ensure that optimum exchange rate. And remember now that we're changing seasons again, the cold, the heat, as well as humidity levels can affect those air exchange rates. So if it's something that you're unsure about, good time to get with facilities and learn about that. Next slide. Quarantining, we're all very familiar with quarantining. But as a reminder, quarantine separates and restricts the movement of individuals who are exposed to contagious disease to monitor if they've become sick. So they're not sick yet, but they've been exposed. We wanna make sure that you know, they're contained. These individuals may have been exposed to disease and do not know it that they have the, the disease, but do not show symptoms. And the purpose of this is to protect others, especially if we have others that have comorbidities that put them at greater risk. And it's also based on disease incubation time. This is another guideline to keep up to date on as we know the guidelines for quarantine throughout uh, the pandemic have changed. So keep an eye out for changing guidelines when it comes to quarantining. Next slide. Source isolation. 
Source isolation separates those suspected or confirmed to have a contagious disease from people who are not infected or sick. So this is your cohorting. This is making sure that those people who have COVID-19 are roomed together so that they don't continue to spread it. The duration is based on a contagious period. And um, the CDC has a great resource for what to do if you're sick. And this one is focused on home-based individuals, but they have many more on the same website. So I suggest if you know you need a little update on that to click on that link, um, we put that in chat for you and um, get up to date on those things. Because again, they do change quite often. Next slide. Isolation guidelines. So there's a, this is another great CDC resource and this is kind of what it looks like. It gives different infections or conditions, the type of precaution, the duration of the precaution needed, and the comments about it. So if you're unsure if you have, if maybe you're new to your facility and you're unsure what um, the precautions need to be, things like C. diff, RSV, as well as COVID-19, we need to make sure that we're up to date because those other infections are still a part of our communities in addition to COVID-19. Next slide. So also on their website, um, it lets us know we can search through different infections to find the specific one that we're looking for. Uh, has in Appendix A, it has all the precautions that we need. So if you have a patient that needs to be on droplet precautions or some other type of precaution, um, it gives you all the information you'll need to properly care for that patient or that resident in your facility. Next slide. Some opportunities for action. We're always looking for opportunities to kind of take the, take the charge and make sure that we're working diligently to keep infections out of our facilities. So when it comes to vendor, vendors and visitors, making sure those masks are available and worn correctly. Um, looking at this little diagram here, the first guy, it's hard to see, but his mask is below his nose. Uh, the other one is on her, you know, top of her head, the other one is below, and then the other one is correct. So just having little reminders around your facility, not just for your staff, for your residents and the families as well. Having hand hygiene, have hand sanitizer available, or hand washing stations. And our screening practices. Um, a lot of facilities are no longer doing screenings. I've walked into a couple of facilities recently where one was doing temperature checks. I walked into a different one on the same day and they weren't doing temperature checks. So I think it depends on your facility's guidelines, but making sure you're staying vigilant to those guidelines. And if your facility needs to change them, letting your staff, your residents and the families know before they change. Sometimes that's not always easy to do, but this way they're prepared, especially if you have to restrict things a little more because maybe the community transmission rate is getting high. So again, keeping in contact and clear communication. Next slide. Some other opportunities for action is doing your environmental rounds. Looking at your kitchen, is the food being stored at proper room temperature? If it's not, can lead to food poisoning. So that's one of those areas that can quickly make a lot of people sick, especially those with comorbidities. Laundry, is the temperature of the water hot enough to sanitize linens? Are bath and showers being cleaned and sanitized? So these are all opportunities for action. And it's not just something that's your responsibility, it's the responsibility of all of those in the community, your staff, your residents, the families, everybody is involved. Next slide. So another opportunity for action for us is involving our clients and family, as well as our staff. And the main thing is education. So infection risk, what are the, the risks of getting an infection? 
hand hygiene. Hand hygiene is really, really important when it comes to mitigating risk. Something that we have always been taught, but again, it gets, we get tired of washing our hands. My hands uh, during the height of the pandemic were, were really dry and painful, but it's important to remember that that's one of the biggest things that we can do to keep people safe. So the CDC has this poster that you can go to the link and print, uh, download and print. So you can put it up in your facility and you don't have to recreate it. Um, you wanna remind people not to share personal items, especially if they have an infection. Um, things like pink eye, you know, sharing a towel, suddenly you have a whole unit of residents with pink eye. And also give permission to remind others, it's okay to ask for safe, clean hands and having door signs. There's been times that I go to my doctor and they walk in the room and they don't wash their hands, at least not in front of me. So I ask, can you please wash your hands? I am immunocompromised. So that's something that I have to take the responsibility for in asking. I've never had a physician get upset or frustrated with me. Um, so again, teaching your staff, it's okay for people to ask you and for you to just go ahead and wash, the, wash your hands. I do have a short video that I'd like to share with you. And it is a fun activity that, um, especially now that the Olympics are over, that you can share with your staff and kind of come up with your own um, Olympics. So this is the hand washing Olympics. Let me share. Welcome to UCLA's Hand Washing Finals. I'm Troy Hirsch and joining me is our in-house expert, Dan Uslan, who's medaled in several previous hand washing games. This year, for the first time, players will be competing using two styles, regular soap and water hand washing and the hand sanitizer method. And Dan, tell us about what the judges will be looking for. Well, Troy, the judges will be paying very close attention to three things, technique, time and detail, how do they wash their hands, did they do it long enough, and do they pay attention to the fine points that are important to their specific interaction. Healthcare associated infections sicken 2 million Americans each year and are responsible for about 100,000 deaths. Most of those transmissions, unfortunately, are caused by healthcare workers. We should also note the judges will only be observing hand washing. Gowning and gloving is a separate event. Well, let's keep that in mind as we go inside. Our three finalists are getting ready, but Rose Hernandez of Environmental Services will go first after winning the coin toss. Here she is during her all-important stretching routine before her final performance. She'll no doubt use her background as a ballet dancer to her advantage here. Let's wait for the signal. And here she goes. Oh, look at that! Knocking and asking permission before entering the room should definitely earn her extra points. And it looks like she's going for the hand sanitizer method. As we mentioned, this is considered by the judges as a preferred method of cleaning your hands. But here's the catch, Troy. They're not effective when hands are visibly dirty or if they're greasy. Dan, you're the expert here, but I don't think the judges are going to find any fault with these hands. The only fault the judges would see is if there's a spore precaution sign for C. diff on the door, as that requires soap and water on room exit. And looking at the instant replay, we don't see spore precautions, so gel is acceptable. You see how she's rubbing not only her palms, but the backs of her hands and between her fingers? Super important to get that coverage, Troy. And it looks like she's rubbing till her hands are dry, which should get her big points. And that's how Rose gets it done. She looks triumphant as she reaches for the gloves to continue work. And it's worth noting that all the competitors here are demonstrating something that's seriously lacking in healthcare today, Dan. Well, that's right, Troy. Studies show that nationwide, 50% of healthcare workers are not compliant with hand hygiene rules. Well, our next competitor is surely not among them. Dr. Thackeray Dubin, who's been in practice for over 20 years, is one of the only physicians to make it to the finals of these games. Dr. Dubin is getting ready to go into the exam room now. He looks more confident than we've seen him in the past, which is a good sign, Troy. And here he goes. He's knocking waiting for permission, which will no doubt score big with the judges. 
Oh, but look, what's he doing, Dan? He's walking towards the patient without washing with water or gelling in Troy. I have never seen anything like this. And look, there's the ref and his coach entering the room now. He's being disqualified. Boy, does his coach look upset. This clearly did not go according to the playbook. And just like that, Dr. Dubin is out of the games. He's got to have an explanation for that, Dan, but I can't imagine what it is. We've never seen something like this in the finals before. Let's take it back to the floor where our own Tracy Chen is with Dr. Dubin. Okay, so Dr. Dubin, walk me through what happened. Uh, why did you forget to wash your hands? Yeah, I, I didn't forget, okay? I, I reviewed that chart before I came in. I knew that I wasn't going to touch the patient or anything in the room, and I just, uh, I just came in to talk with her. I, I can't believe that the ref disqualified me. Uh, it's just totally unfair. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dubin. Back to you. All right, thanks, Tracy. I don't know, Dan. Clearly, the judges must have had good reason to disqualify Thackeray Dubin. Uh, well, the rules have changed this year. This patient is in contact precautions, and hospital policy states that he must wash his hands and wear gowns and gloves on room entry, even if he's not planning on touching the patient. You can see that even though he had no intention of touching anything in the room, Dr. Dubin did, in fact, touch the curtain, as we see in the instant replay. He then touched the chair and bed rail. What if, during the interaction, there was a need to examine the patient? Not to mention, Troy, studies show that patients actually feel better about the care they're going to get if they physically see the caregiver wash or sanitize their hands in view of the patient. I'm definitely going to side with the judges on this one. Well, this unexpected turn of events certainly makes this very interesting. The race is now between Rose Hernandez and our third and final competitor, Julie Lockwood. Lockwood is a night nurse in the postpartum department. She's heavily favored to sweep these games, Dan. That's right, Troy. She's known as a meticulous caregiver who's a favorite with her patients. And here she goes, moving down the hallway with purpose and a very determined look. Here she's knocking, waiting for permission, just like Rose and Dr. Dubin did. She greets the patient before doing anything, communicates what she's about to do, which is fantastic to see, and there goes the soap, and look at that. Wait, what is she doing, Dan? She's singing happy birthday, Troy. She's trying to ensure that she washes her hands for the 15 seconds it takes to sing that song. That's a pro move. She's washing between her fingers and the backs of her hands. She's even washing under her nails. But wait, what's she doing now? Whoa, she's connecting, Troy. She's doing CI care with the patient while competing. That goes to show you washing her hands at this level comes naturally to her. That is going to score her big, big bonus points. Let's take a closer look at her scrubbing. You can see that meticulous attention to detail. This is what earns players high praise with the judges. This reminds me of your performance back in 2010, Dan. And she's done it. Now that was a gold medal performance. And here comes the scores. It looks like the judges agree. Julie Lockwood has clinched the gold medal and the silver goes to Rose Hernandez. That was a nail biter, Troy. You know, these games get better and better every year. We've certainly come a long way in hand hygiene since my days as a competitor. I couldn't agree more. Well, coming up in just a few minutes, we'll take you to the medal ceremony. But after the commercial break, we head over to the gowning and gloving competition, followed by a preview of the linen folding semifinals. Stay with us, the games continue. Okay, I hope you all enjoyed that video as much as I enjoy it. I've seen it a few times and each time I see it, it, it is enjoyable. Um, so again, just a reminder, using a fun activity such as what we just saw in the video can really help provide that education and make it fun and memorable. Um, because especially when it comes to uh, hand washing and keeping things fun and keeping that education going, the more memorable you make it, the easier it is to get people to do that. Whether it's hand washing um, or even having, you know, that gowning and gloving games that they talked about in the video, something fun and exciting to keep it moving. Okay, next slide. So these are some communication resources that are available um, to talk to your residents, your staff, anybody about COVID-19. And we have a few that are for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. We even have um, a resource available from the CDC on American Sign Language. So again, if you have someone who may be hearing impaired and need that video, 
um, there's the link to it. Next slide. And here's a form, few more resources available um, for C, from CMS guidance for infection control prevention concerning coronavirus. Um, the non-medical healthcare institutions. Uh, the one that I specifically like is guidance for direct service providers, caregivers, parents, and people with developmental disabilities and behavioral disorders. Um, oftentimes in facilities, you're dealing with a resident who may have developmental or behavior disorders. So having uh, guidance to help talk to them or um, guide them through wearing PPE or hand washing. Sometimes we need those resources and we don't always know where to get them. Did anyone have any questions? I don't see anything in chat as far as questions. Thank you, Lori and Kendra for, and um, Mary Jo for joining us. Marisol, thank you for joining us as well. We do have a short survey we would like you to complete before we sign off for today. So I think we're gonna bring that up. Thank you very much. And if you could just take a moment of your time to fill out that survey, we would appreciate it. I hope you um, enjoyed the presentation today. If you have any questions or need anything from us, please feel free to reach out to us. We're always happy to help. This is Adrienne. Great presentation, Edie. Thank you so much. I um, work in nursing homes as well and uh, based here in Salt Lake City, Utah. And we've seen a lot of findings with our surveys related to hand washing. Um, and so we're... <clears throat> trying to do what we can to really kind of infuse those auditing and other QI efforts um, with a little bit of creativity here. So I would just love to hear if there's anyone um, on the call that maybe has any tips or tricks that they've used in kind of auditing their donning and doffing or, you know, hand washing. Um, I was just curious if anybody has anything that they've tried that's working in their facility or nursing home or anything, um, you know, that, that you may uh, find appealing that you want to incorporate just while we have some people here from across our different nursing homes. And feel free to put that in chat if you, uh, so people can't come off mute. Well, we're always happy to hear if you have any thoughts or, or other ideas outside of this um, presentation, our contact information is there. Okay, well, thank you all for joining us. We look forward to next week's presentation and hope you all have a great week. Thank you very much. Thank you.